Since I was a kid, I dreamt always about shipwrecks, gold, treasures, pirates. I guess this is one of the dreams. Well, if we found the treasure, it might spoil the dream. If we won't find the treasure, we go on dreaming. This is the Sinai Desert. The Bedouins say that when God finished making the world, he had a few bits left over. He threw them down in the Red Sea, and they became the Sinai. Its coast is a treasure hunter's paradise strewn with wrecks. Between the desert and the deep blue sea are the coral reefs. To say that this coast is treacherous would be an understatement. The coral can come rising up from the bottom in what they call a coral head, as much as five miles out to sea. So that just when a ship might think it's thoroughly safe and well clear of land, it can actually be heading towards a chunk of coral. And a great many ships have discovered that to their cost. The wreck we're after, Lawrence of Arabia's wreck, they call it, lies here. It's been found at the foot of the reef, covered by deep water and a certain amount of mystery. We're in at the start of a treasure hunt with some of the hunters. They'll work from here, Sharam El Sheikh, and they must be quick. The port is to be handed over from Israel to Egypt sometime after the current peace talks end, and that may mean the end of diving for the Israelis. The Sinai coast is a place of untamed spirits. Where fierce sea eagles are at home, so are the sort of men who would hunt for gold. Sharem is full of men making plans. Even by Israeli standards, the people here are individualists. They say that if a friendship lasts for three weeks, it's a record, and nobody agrees about anything for long. If you ask questions around the bay, no one agrees about who first found the wreck. One story goes like this. A man called Keller was lowering survey microphones into the sea when one of them caught on something. Well, I found a wreck uh, when uh, I dived to take out the microphone and stuck on this uh, wreck. It was a very beautiful wreck, full with coal. Later on, I dived again on it, and I, I tell Howard about it. Now he said that he found it. Howard runs a local diving club. He's organizing one of the expeditions to the wreck. If there is something inside her, who does he say gets it? Well, I think it's the people who discover it. Is it? Well, the people right now, it's us, because we're the first ones who've really taken upon ourselves to do a serious exploration of the place. What about the other groups of divers around here who are also interested in diving on it? What about them? They're interested in diving on it, but they know, well, whatever they know, they know from us, and they don't have the means so much to get there like we do. And uh, we just have to organize ourselves and get out there faster. Would you be prepared to share any of the information you may, may get with them? What for? There are three others on the team. Shlomo is an artist and photographer. He's published a series of diving maps and guidebooks that you can read underwater. There's Yossi, Howard's partner in the diving club, a wartime combat diver drawn into this mission by what? The simple passion that everybody has to dive in wrecks, you know, to remember all the stories from the childhood about uh, gold and, uh, and uh, treasures under the water and so on. So I think that this is one of the motives also. It must be quite a strong passion, because I'm told that your wife is about to have a baby and you've come down here. <laughs> and the fourth member of the team, another wartime diver, Commander Speer. This is the expedition's diving boat. They sank her on a reef last month, and he's just finished raising and repairing her, ready for the trip out. It'll be his first visit to the wreck. I don't make a lot thinking about it uh, till I see it first time, then I can measure it, I see how long it is, how bright it is, what engine it is, and then I can get a picture of what wreck it is, but really, to tell you the truth, I have not any idea about it. 
No romantic speculation no, at all? No, not romantic at all. There's no time to waste. The waters where the wreck lies, beyond Ras Mohammed Point, may soon be handed back to Egypt. And word that the wreck may be Lawrence's gold ship from 1917 is luring other divers from as far away as Germany and Sweden. It's attracted the United States ambassador, Sam Lewis, too. Straight from the latest peace talks. Good morning. How are Welcome you? home. Thank you. <laughs> How are you? Oh, fine. I did the dirty, dirty deed yesterday. Yeah. For you. <laughs> What'd you do? Well, you gave it away. You gave it away. Well, no, listen, <laughs> but you know, you know, listen, you know, it's two and a half hours late finishing. You heard that. What, what, what That's was That's why reason? I got here at two o'clock in the morning. It was on the radio, though. What was the I spent two and a half hours trying to persuade them. Ras Muhammad. To stick the line a little further <laughs> west. Did you? Did you I succeed? Did. No, I failed. You failed. But I really worked at it. Two and a half hours, you know. We had uh, 200 people sitting out there waiting for the ceremony, and the sun was getting lower in the west. And there I was arguing for your damn dive sites. And it didn't work. Well, you know, uh, maybe we'll get it next time. Yeah, you think so? But did it go OK? I mean, we were pretty, you yeah. know, I mean, in the end, it worked out OK? No, it worked out fine. Yeah? We had to talk to Sadat and to Begin on the phone and straighten out a few last minute problems. Really? You think I'll be able to operate? For three years, anyway. For three? <laughs> three? <laughs> three? Can I Do you have any ideas what this wreck might be? Any private theories? Well, my th I have a, a, a theory which I think I cooked up, and then Howard later told me it was his idea. <laughs> I, I'm convinced that it was a ship which was taking the gold payments from Suez around to Lawrence's Bedouin fighters in Aqaba in 1917, and somehow or other ran aground before it ever got to Aqaba. So my theory is somewhere below that sand, there's some gold coins. It'll be a three-hour trip along the Sinai coast, round Ras Mohammed Point, and up to the Sharab Ali Reef. Some of the people on board have been down to the wreck once already. They found some china plates with the word Dunraven on some of them. Is that the name of the ship? They've tried to find out. Can I have that envelope? I, uh, I sent a message off to London to see if we could get any information from Lloyd on a ship called the Dunraven. This is the whole file of the information that we've got. But we did get some information back. The first thing we got said that the... Ma? Oops, there goes one. The missing bit of paper is no great loss. The American Major's inquiries hadn't produced a clear answer about any ship called Dunraven. It seems unlikely that that could be the name of the wreck. Sunk. Do you think we have much chance of finding the name of the actual ship written on the ship down there? No, I re I'd be very doubtful if we could find it because there's so much coral that's overgrown it. But of course, if we can just, if we can find the name, I mean, the complete name of the ship, then it's gonna be probably very, very uh, much easier to find out more information about it. That's the whole key, is the name of the ship. It's a nice mystery, this. It looks as though the ship is going to be very reluctant to reveal its name under the coral. We think that it might help if we had some research effort back in Britain on this. So from today, we have two researchers who are burrowing in the Admiralty's records of warships lost and in Lloyd's records of civilian ships. All they have to go on at the moment is that somewhere down here is a steel ship with one propeller and some china plates with the name Dunraven on. We don't know if the next clue will come from them back in Britain or from something that our divers will find on the ship here when they go down in a minute. The wreck is so thick in coral that she's gradually changing from a ship into a place.
She's too big for the camera to show the whole majestic bulk of her. But Shlomo, the artist, can do it with a drawing built up from his underwater sketch pad. She lies capsized on the seabed with the reef behind her growing up to the surface a hundred feet above. You can see the propeller clearly, each blade as big as a man. There are portholes and rips in her side big enough to swim through. Her back is broken. If you swim down into the gap, it's like being between two church arches. Two masts lie on the sand beside her. They're working their way along the ship's bottom. Moses and Cecil B. DeMille just divided the Red Sea and walked on the seabed. For divers, it's not so easy. There's a determined current. At this depth, a man can only do two short dives a day, no more than 30 minutes altogether, or he risks those cramps that are the terror of divers, the bends, agonizing and sometimes fatal. The hull is rusty and treacherous. Girders may collapse on top of them. In a vivid setting, it's plodding work. They have no heavy equipment. The expedition's been organized in too much of a rush for that. While two of them search inside, the other two measure the outside. It takes two men all the time they have on one dive to do it. It's about 270 feet. The other two have got into what seems to be the galley, the kitchen. Time to get out. Fifteen minutes are up. They must go to the surface for several hours now. I found a couple of ours. It's fabulous. It was heavy, so I left it down there. Haven't found too much gold. I don't know where the door is, but I found the handle that closes it. Is there gold down there? Of course there is. So you give up your share in the gold. Did you see the entrance there? I saw it. There was a sign to the gold. I bet you. From now on, you can retire. Which way had the ship been heading when she struck? Did she sink quickly, or did she lie on top of the reef where Bedouin fishermen might have looted her? It's a chance for a nice, bracing discussion. I think she stands on the reef quite time, quite long time. And then, in one of the south storms, she fell down. North storms. South storm. Why? She was. She came from south with a okay, no, stand okay. to the north direction. No, okay. South stream. No, no, no. What is it? The wind is south. The wind is south. The wind is south. The wind is south. Maybe. I don't think so. It's not logic because she was. She went south. No, no east. No. She came from Suez. No. And she was carrying something. No. And she was carrying to the Bedouin tribes in Aqaba Gulf. So she was heading east. No, maybe she came back from Aqaba. She came back from Aqaba, there is nothing to find there. Yeah. Okay. Hydrochloric acid. Look, look, look. 
הצלחת הזאת הם גנבו מזה מקום, זה לא שלהם. זה לא אותו פלט שאנחנו ראינו לפני. אתה יכול לראות שזה יותר פלט בפלט בפלט. This, this one, which... This one says engineers, you see? You see? Now, Chris. Yeah. It's Jack. Have you got anything? Have you got anything? Our researchers in London have discovered a Dunraven. But there's a puzzle. In 1910, her name was changed to Sarah Radcliffe, and she sank in British waters. Yet we have a growing pile of plates marked Dunraven. It's proving very difficult, is it? It's very difficult. Next day, on the trip out to the reef, a brisk reminder of local tensions. Stop taking photographs. If you don't want to be photographed, go away. I'm going to confiscate your camera. These waters may soon belong to Egypt, but right now they're as secure as the Israeli Navy can make them. Everything we film will be checked by the sensor. There are Navy people here too, so don't get excited. I only want your details. If you don't want to be photographed, clear off. You don't tell me when to go. You are only the Navy. Guard us. Don't interfere with us. Speer thinks the Navy are overdoing it, and he points this out to them. I personally will see you get into trouble. It looks like a nice, peaceful area, but it's full of action. Lawrence was a spy, they thought that we are spies, you know, all the time. On the next dive, they find a nameplate on the wreck. It's uh, right at the aft of the boat. In the aft, in the, in the stern. In the stern. And, uh, in the aft. And uh, there is a, uh, I think it was built on a piece of metal. And it timed it three letters, like D, E, N. And then, and then the name of the cowboy or something like this, which is? I don't know, we have to find out, we have to work on it and to discover the letters. There, beneath the coral, in solid letters, upside down but unmistakable, in spite of what we've heard from London, is the name Dunraven. There are more letters lower down, probably the port of registration, but they remain a mystery under impenetrable coral. On this dive, we have a coral expert. The hope is that he can tell how long the coral's been growing on the wreck, and therefore, how long she's been down there. Can you give any idea of how long the ship's been down there on the coral? Well, uh, it seems to be something between 50 and 70 years. After that, water noise swamped our microphone, but the opinion was that the wreck had been there some 50 to 70 years, which fitted in with Lawrence and 1917. <laughs> We have got visitors. Who is it? Trouble. It's an old rival of Howard's called Big Alex. He's a shark fisherman. 
We've got people in the water. I've been here since morning. You're driving my sharks away. Get your bait out of the water. He's got his hooks in the water. The sharks are going to start coming here. We got divers in the water over there, and they're going to start coming over where the ship is. We got to get, we're going to have to cut his, cut his hooks and we'll get him out of here. Or else I'll just take my goddamn boat and put it right into the side of his boat. He's not allowed to fish here. It's against the law to fish here. And he's going to screw up everything that's going on here. I'm going to try one more time to talk to him. If he doesn't do it, I'm going to cut his line. By evening, the row has been forgotten and peace reigns at Sharm el Sheikh. In the Divers Club, they've been showing an American made diving film that states categorically that the wreck is one of Lawrence's supply ships from 1917. The man who could confirm that has been dead for years, of course, but he did leave a comprehensive account of his campaigns, so Lawrence may still be able to help us check out the gold ship theory. The theory is based on some ancient, not ancient, but quite old speculation that I picked up from a, a Bedouin, a Bedouin uh, guide. He's a, tra a tracker in the Sinai, a very famous and very wise old man named Suleiman. And uh, his father before him was, was also a guide and a tracker. And their family just known as their living legends in this area as far as knowing historically and geographically as much as there is to know. Can we find this Suleiman? <laughs> It depends what he's doing right now. He might be out, out in the mountains out there somewhere. We know that Lawrence did ship gold around this coast because he says in his book that he had to pay the Arab sheikhs who led the revolt against the Turks at Aqaba and that they didn't trust paper money. So he actually sent for gold sovereigns to be shipped out from England. And in his book, he names some of his supply ships. He names the Dufferin, the Hardinge, the Suva, and the M31, but he doesn't say anything about the Dunraven. Our guide has heard that the grandson of Suleiman, the man who knows, is camping here in the Wadikid Valley. He may know which oasis the old tracker is at. <laughs> قول لي تعرف وين الشيخ سليمان ابو حمدي؟ ابو حمدي هنا على الجبل. على دي جبل؟ ايوه في البحر. في البحر؟ اه. بالنبت. ايوه. الف شكرا. الله يسلمك. الله يسلمك. هي سيدة الشيخ سليمان از اوفر ذيس ماونتن ان بلايس كول نبك. There is a lot of stories about ship in some which carried gold but if there is ship nobody found them. And for sure, Awa didn't find it. Are you saying that if they do find some gold on this ship, you on don't want ship, any? Whenever I dive on this ship, I just look for fish. And that's for me like gold. And in a few minutes, we will meet uh, this guy which we talk about him, uh, Sheikh Slim, Suleiman Abu Hamd. He should sit here. Are you sure he's going to be here? I'm for sure. There he is. <laughs> so certain as that. OK, let's stop. I'm going to ask him what he knows. I will take my cigarette. We'll have some tea, I think. Uh -huh. That's for sure, but the story about the boat, we'll have it for sure. Well, this is the big moment. Right. Protocol. Strong sweet tea must come first. To start asking questions straight away would be an affront to Bedouin hospitality. That's like we are grass. After two glasses of tea, the moment is right. زي واحد شيخ علشان بيجيب عم فصيصة زي القرنيط القرنيط بيوديه من هون ل للدير زي واحد شيخ. and he said that he knows some some ship 
that Im's father told him, that he knows, and then Im's grandfather told him. Ask him if he knows if it has any connection with, with Lawrence of Arabia. He never heard of him. Would you thank him for the tea? And we found Suleiman, and he says he never even heard of Lawrence. It's a little different than what he told me, because he told me... Well, you know, he didn't say the name Lawrence to me. But he said that, you know, in the time when they were having the, the fighting, just before World War I, and the preparation before that, that there was a white person that was coming and was paying the Bedouins, and he was going by ships. And so I never asked him, is it Lawrence, uh, T.E. Lawrence, or anything like that. I just said, well, you know, if any of the ships were went aground, they're in this area. And he had told me about one ship that had went aground. The trouble is that the, the story about this ship being connected with Lawrence is, is what seems to be in, in the air that everybody believes is that it came from a Bedouin around here. That one looks a bit difficult at the moment. Speer, what do you feel? Look, I'm here as an expert for underwater jobs. I don't know who was Lawrence already. <laughs> so I see a ship, sunk ship. It's very nice. I'm digging, I'm looking. That's all. We try London again. Any more clues? When we get through, our researchers have come up with another Dunraven. Her story comes partly from Lloyd's and partly from the Royal Navy's Department of History at Greenwich, and it seems she was an extraordinary ship and famous. The Dunraven was what was known as a Q ship. She was a merchant ship taken over by the Navy in 1917, fitted with concealed guns, filled with cork and ping pong balls to make her as near unsinkable as possible, and sent out as a wolf in sheep's clothing to lure U-boats. Her final action was under Captain Gordon Campbell, VC. Two of her crew won VCs, and between them, they won 39 other honors on that day. What happened was this. A U-boat surfaced and opened fire on the Dunraven. Campbell waited. He wanted the U-boat to go on thinking Dunraven was a harmless merchantman and to come so close that he could be sure of sinking it with one shot, giving his enemy no chance to dive and escape. For half an hour, Campbell sat under fire at almost point-blank range. His ship was burning and listing, but Campbell still wouldn't fire until the U-boat presented a perfect target. Just as she did, the Dunraven's magazine exploded, frightening the U-boat into a dive. On the sinking Dunraven, the gun's crew still waited, knowing that they would now be torpedoed, but hoping they might still get a chance to fire. The torpedo came, and the U-boat finally quit with her ammunition spent. Only then did the crew take to the boats and leave the Dunraven to sink. The trouble is, it doesn't solve our mystery because it all happened in the Atlantic, thousands of miles from our ship. It's not this ship. Quite sure? Quite right. sure. No. I saw his ghost down there. <laughs> Imagine. It's a ghost ship. What, what can it be? How, how can they be the Lloyd's? Look, I'll, Lloyd, buy, Lloyd's I'll, buy, I'll buy a ghost ship. I like it, really. But Lloyd, Lloyd's, tell us, two Dunravens. Oh, both sunk in the we English Channel. Name. We'll give you the name of the Dunraven. We found plates with the name Dunraven. How come you can't find nothing? Lloyd's or the British Admiralty or whatever. Well, boats don't uh, come and go without any trace, especially with insurance you know, companies you know, and the type of uh, policies that they have. So if a ship goes, uh, disappears, I mean, uh, it just doesn't go into thin air. Well, a ship will go without any, any documents or, so, or nothing if it's a secret mission. The secret mission theory does fit the next idea we get from London. A theory has come from the Imperial War Museum that in the First World War, poison gas was being used in Europe by the British and the Germans. Yeah, we know it. There was apparently a secret plan to use it out here against the Turks by the British. And the War Museum say it's a possibility, especially as there seems to be some secrecy around this ship, it's hard to get through the records and penetrate them, there's a possibility that it might have been carrying poison gas, which was never okay, actually I used out here. Work today. <laughs> <laughs> that's the end of the work. OK, let's go home. <laughs> poison gas. Poison gas? Any signs, there's any evidence, as anything long as, you look for? Uh, oh, you use some containers to this. As long as right. we keep uh, 
breathing out of our regulators on the water will be fine. You. Yeah. On the next dive, no sign of poison gas. A new piece of equipment, a homemade air pump, helps hoover away some of the sand, but none of the mystery. They've been diving on this Dunraven for four days now, and still no one has any idea what her cargo is, or how it can be that the only Dunravens on record are both listed as being sunk in another ocean. The answer, whatever it may be, is as elusive as ever. There are no more clues on this dive. They bring up nothing but a cabin sink. On the fifth day, a gale stops the diving. It's the Hamseen, the hot wind from the desert that makes camels snap their nostrils shut and stops the Bedouin fishermen going out just when it matters most. This is the only season when Israeli conservation laws allow them to fish for snapper. We want the wind to stop so that we can get on with our diving on the wreck. But I just came across a gruesome indication of how much more important it is to the Bedouin fishermen that it should stop. I was walking along the edge of the water and I found this. I thought at first it was a fish, but it has hair on it. So I asked what it was. And I was told that they just killed a sheep. Let me show you what they've done with it. They've taken the sheep's blood and made a mark of a hand here. There it is, on the bow of the boat. It's called the hamsa. And that is supposed to bring them luck and stop the wind blowing. And more gruesome yet, perhaps, but we hope effective, they have the sheep's head here in the bow of their boat. Now, let's, let's see if anybody here knows anything about this mystery ship. Does, does this gentleman know anything about the ship that went onto the rocks out there? Can you ask him? We agree to pay for filming their sheep's head, but now things bog down in a haggle about how much we'll pay to talk with them. This is the nearest camp to the wreck, so maybe somewhere here there'll be some Bedouin who will help us. Could I talk to you? Could I talk to you? Excuse me, could I talk with you? Hello? Yeah. Hello. Do you know anything about this wreck off the coast here? Well, which one? There's several, I think, aren't there? There's talk about quite a lot, is there? I've got. No, as far as I know, there are. There's a particular one that they've discovered quite recently. You haven't heard anything about that? I don't think about that. Yeah. Where are you from? Where? Well, here in Israel, in England. In England? From Cornwall. How come you're here? My husband fished us here. He's Israeli, is he? Yes. Do you ever do any diving or swimming off the reef? I don't know. My husband does, I think. Does he know anything about this wreck, do you know? He may do. I, I don't know. I mean, he obviously knows the wrecks here because they go out on the boats around here. They know the, the reefs and things. Uh -huh. Pardon? But he's, uh, he's away, isn't he? Let's come back so we can ask him if he has any ideas about it. Yaakov? Do you know anything about the wreck out there? Yes. What, what do you know? I don't know. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Two days later, the sheep's head has worked. The wind's dropped a bit. But as we approach the wreck, we see that a strange diving boat has tied up over her. Well, first of all, let them move. That's something else. Well, we talk. The point is, what are you going to say to them? Now, listen, I feel very close to this ship because I was involved with the original discovery and, and finding, finding out about, and I've been living with 
with this legend or something for a long time now. And just so tourists could come in just out of nowhere and start taking things and taking it apart. It, it bothers me, it does. What are you going to do about it? Oh, there's not too much I can do about it. What we probably will do is once we do go, take our dive, is uh, put our air pumps down there and just fill it up with sand until the next time we dive. So whoever goes down there after that won't be able to find anything. The other divers are based at a rival club. They see Howard's attitude as less than generous. I think the idea is that he thinks it's his ship. That's, I think that's the only reason why he don't like other people diving there. What do you think you found out? We found a little egg cup, which uh, said the name of Dan Ravin on it. So uh, all of us, to us it sounded very English, but uh, when we came back to the club, uh, this Dutch girl here, she said it's, and uh, her friend, they said it's a small town in the north of Holland. Can't it possible uh, be an English uh, name? Any more evidence that it might be Dutch? Anything else? Well, now something new came up, yes. Uh, I happened to be on a boat yesterday who took out the toilet, or one of the toilets, and it was uh, beautifully painted inside, porcelain, blue painted, and uh, the figures on the boats uh, resemble very much Dutch people. The hats they used to have, the women's, the buns they used to wear with the clothes over it. So that uh, strengthened my idea. Okay, let's say it's named after a town in Holland. That doesn't mean that it's a, a, a Dutch ship whatsoever. Everything that we found up until now on the Which ship in London it, 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 it indicates it has a, a British connection and, and not a Dutch connection. But, uh, the, you know, just before, just because the name isn't enough. But neither is our information. Eight days have gone by now, and the clues are as confusing as ever. Just in front of the funnel, the coral expert finds a bone. Could it be human? Something, I think it's something related with the arms. The hand or the arm, some area. No? The shoulder. To the shoulder. Yeah? Something shoulder here. The, the arm. Yes. OK, maybe. Yes. It's okay. part of the bone. OK. Right. Time is running out. The waters must soon be handed over to Egypt, and after nine days of diving and research, we know very little more than when we started. All we've found out is that the ship is called Dunraven, and she seems to have been here about 60 years, since around 1918. No Lawrence's gold, no Q-ship secret guns, no poison gas, no answers. What you're watching is the nearest thing to a frustrated frenzy that a man under 100 feet of water can manage. Can brute force hack the answer out of her? Or could it be that it's already waiting for us in some detail we've overlooked? This is the hoard that the divers have brought up so far. It's cracked, chipped, encrusted with coral, some of the bottles are oozing with strange smelling substances. It's dilapidated and mysterious. But in all this, we can search for clues. All the portholes in the hull are being found wide open, both the glass windows and the metal storm shutters. Now that seems to suggest that the ship sank very suddenly and quickly without any warning. In getting hold of all these clues, our divers are having to grope through clouds of sand. And back in London, it's very much the same thing for our researchers, they're having to find their way through clouds of facts to try and find out which ones actually matter. So far, everything we've followed up has turned out to be a red herring. But we think now that we may have a breakthrough. And it's this bottle. It says Webb's Double Soda and Other Waters, Islington, London. Now, on checking that out, we find that Mr. Webb was making his soda in Islington way back in 1826, but that he stopped in 1905. So maybe time and our imaginations have been deceiving us. Maybe the ship is much older than anybody has thought. And when you check out the pottery and the china, we find that this piece has a mark on the back with the initials very faint, hard to read, GFB. Now GFB, it turns out, 
is George Frederick Bowers, who was making pottery in Staffordshire, but who stopped way back in 1886. Armed with that, our researcher has been back to Lloyd's. They say that if the ship is much older, say one of the first steamships, it would never have been on their international register. That only goes back to 1886. Why don't we try the new public records office at Kew? Jack, will you come here for a minute? Somebody wants you on the radio. In over. What do I do? Press this. But just push this. Hello? Jack, uh, good morning. Good morning. Who's that? Uh, it's your talk with you. Good morning. Good morning, Yo. What's the news? Uh, the letter with the information about the white sheep arrived uh, at morning from London with Captain Avi, a pilot of El Al. Not the captain, he's the first officer. So he flew it out on El Al, and where is it now? The letter in Tel Aviv, but uh, we have a problem because of the strike of our Kia airline. So maybe we can use a plane of the Israeli Air Force. Okay, we expect to get back into Sharm at about half past six this evening, maybe a little earlier. Do you think you can get it down by then? Whoa. Dan Raven. Dan Raven. The Dan Raven. <laughs> Just a moment. Bro. Whoa. Whoa. The seam? Yep. The first man, second. Mm -hmm. Still on the horse, not correct. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, look, at that. look at all the cabins back there. Yeah. Look at all that cabin yeah. right there. Yeah. That's ah. it. There's the and bridge, it, and the it, bridge in the middle. Right yeah. In the middle. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's where, we, that's where the wheels are. Yeah. 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 The, the, right in front of the steam room is the bridge. Fantastic. Oh boy. When was she built? Already, already. An eight. No, I'm waiting. There's no date here. That's the side I used to see it. That's upside down. That's it. Okay, okay. Where is it made? Wait, 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 wait. Don't wait, wait. Where is it made? Stomo, why don't you read whatever it says here, okay? <laughs> Can you read it? No, read it, read it. <laughs> Steamship, Don Raven. Length overall, 268. Probably it's feet. Point, point three, three feet, yeah. Two, six, yeah. 90, 90, 90 meters. Between, 90 between meters. verb, 260. Uh, C. Mitchell and Company. Where Mitchell, C. Iron, Mitchell and Company. C. Mitchell and Company. Company. Iron C. Shipbuilders, C. Low Walker, Newcastle on Tyne. When was it built? There's more information. It was it was built in Newcastle in 1873. Oh. 1873. It Boy, sank on the 25th of April 1876. Three years ago. She was. She uh, was what new. date? Did, did April 76. 103 years ago. Yeah, almost exactly. Yeah. Almost exactly, yes. It was bound from Karachi back to UK. We don't know what the cargo was yet. UK? No, United, United Kingdom. Kingdom. Yes, United well, Kingdom. it was the, the time of the big empire, you know. Yeah. You? It's, its first owner was somebody called <laughs> William Milburn, but it, it had had 13 owners in three years by the time it sank. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. the, the master of the ship, the captain, was Edward Kerr, who came from Cornwall, and he was only 26. And there'd been three miles. It's in figures. Three years. Yeah, figures. <laughs> figures. You should have missed the reef. Yeah. It had a pig house in front of the funnel. A pig house. Oh. 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 There, there are some news reports at, from the time of the sinking. Um, on the 28th of April, the Times said, it's reported that the Dunraven has been totally lost in the Red Sea, crew saved. A few days later, there was a slightly more detailed report from Newcastle. Information has reached Newcastle of the stranding of the large and valuable steamer Dunraven on the Arabian coast of the Red Sea. Now, stranding suggests not sinking immediately and lying on the reef, is it? Ah. <laughs> ah. 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 
Wait, 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 there's more, there's more. And then there's another one from the, the public records office. It just says, ship lost in the shales of Jubal, 25th of April, 1876. It's not the shales of Jubal. It's the wrong place, isn't it? It's the wrong place. By, about, sure. by what distance? It's so it's about 10 miles. It's about 10 so miles out. There's shale. another reef further up. Yeah. Uh, well, so it is in the Jubal, but you went to Shabali. Maybe there is another Don Ray. <laughs> Why not? I don't know if I can. They're going up it. like flowers. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> when's it up? When's it up? Actually, yeah, this is the third. It's enough. the third. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is the first. No, this one is the first. Yes. Okay. We've all followed a lot of false trails. Mm -hmm. Now we finally got there. What do you feel about it? But I feel that I have a connection with the ship. <laughs> 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 you know, a man who was working with ships all his life, with boats, he has a connection to boats. You know, you like, if you tell me, go to drone a boat, I can't do it. It's like to a, like a dog. Yes, it's, you, are, you are connected to the things, and you like boats, you like ships, and it's, you know, a, a seaman is a sick, sea, uh, seasick. He likes the sea, so the same with boats. <laughs> so <laughs> that, uh, yeah. I know. Yeah. Right, OK. What do you feel about the ship now you know more about it? Yeah, well, at the beginning, I didn't care about the ship. All I was thinking is about Lawrence and the gold, and I didn't pay much attention about the, the size of the ship or where she built or where she came from. And But later on, when we start digging inside, <clears throat> when we found the plates, and we didn't find the gold. <laughs> but today I think it's uh, completely changed. Now I know the ship, I know the history of the ship. And I don't know, I would like to try again. I mean, I, I would like to start with the beginning. Somewhere I think I'm in a race against time to learn as much as I can about the Dunraven before the doors close behind me and, and we just won't be able to go back there again. And then, th then maybe the secret, the final secrets of the Dunraven will never be discovered. Yes, sir. I'm sure that I'd like to dive there again and again, you know, in order to discover more things. You're not going to get romantic about it, though, are you? I don't feel any fe any romantic feelings about the You're boat. You're tough. I'm not tough. <laughs> I don't have any romantic feeling. <laughs> Later, we learned that the Dunraven's cargo had been bales of cotton. And even there, other divers had beaten us to it. They'd salvaged the cargo over a century ago. And the Dunraven, she belongs to Egypt now. And slowly but surely, the coral is molding her into a part of the reef that sank her. Can I run?